As you might imagine, this is an enormous subject, but today I intend to keep things simple and to focus on the species that you might see on your walks. We will look at basic biology, identifying features and some of the more common or easy to identify species. Lichens first attracted my attention as pieces of natural art in the landscape and a fascination for the sheer diversity of form and colour, much of which becomes truly apparent once you look at them more closely. In fact, these ancient organisms are remarkable for many more reasons, having a role as environmental indicators, playing a hugely important role in the erosion of rock and therefore the formation of soils, being able to exploit numerous niches due to their tolerance of extreme conditions and for their chemistry which has been exploited for natural dyes, poisons and even high-end perfumes. So what is a lichen? It's a stable mutualistic association of two or more organisms in other words, organisms that coexist in such a way that each benefits from one another. The association is made up of a fungus, which is called the mycobiont, and which is the dominant species in the partnership, and a green alga, or a cyanobacteria in other cases, which are capable of photosynthesis and hence called the photobiont. Yeasts and other bacteria can also play an important role, but I'm not going to go into any further detail about these today. The mycobiont fungus provides the photobiont partner with a safe place to live and grow amongst its hyphae. The photobiont provides the mycobiont with simple sugars, which it produces by photosynthesis. As I mentioned previously, the fungus is the dominant partner. It is suggested that the relationship evolved as a result of fungi feeding on algae, but because the algal cells reproduce faster than they are consumed, the alga is never completely destroyed, and so the symbiosis has developed. Ninety-eight percent of lichens are formed by species of Ascomycete cup fungi, as shown in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. A few lichens are formed by Basidiomycete species. The most common photobionts are green algae, which mostly come from one or two genera. Trabuxia or Trentpolia. You might see Trentpolia on walls and trees as an orange dust, or in the example shown actually growing on a lichen thallus. Orange pigments obscure the green pigment of the algal chlorophyll. Other species of photobiont are cyanobacteria, which are most commonly represented by the genus Nostoc. When the fungus and partner join, both change physically and chemically to form a lichen. The fungus is said to be lichenized. Although lichens are made up of more than one organism, their species names are based on the fungus and not the photobiont. There are a number of features on the exterior surface of a lichen that can be used to identify some of the species that I'll be introducing you to. Some will need to be magnified, for example viewed with a hand lens. Starting with the main body of the lichen, which is called the thallus. The thallus varies widely in form, but can be categorised into five types, which we shall come to later on in the course. Very characteristic features of many lichen species are apothecia, which commonly look like tiny jam tarts, disc-like structures or spots. The apothecia are where sexual reproduction takes place to produce fungal spores. 
So note that when the spores are released, they need to find the photobiont partner in order to form a new lichen colony. Not all lichens produce apothecia and spores can be produced by other structures as well. Other external features are structures associated with vegetative reproduction. These are structures made up of both mycobiont and photobiont. They are broken off by mechanical action, for example by animals brushing against them, splashing droplets of water or by the wind. And because they are complete little packages of everything needed to grow a thallus, they can grow into a new lichen if conditions are suitable. So structures associated with vegetative reproduction include ascidia, which are finger-like protrusions on the thallus. You can see that they are the same colour as the thallus because they contain photobiont. When you look up close through the hand lens you can see little tiny fingers, like little coralline structures. Other structures associated with vegetative reproduction are ceridia. These are small particles that look like tiny granules or powder arising from dimples or cracks called ceralia. And some lichens have more than one feature, so they can have a mixture of apothecia, ascidia, ceridia. It depends very much on the species. So for example, as you can see on the right hand photograph here, this has both ceridia and ascidia. The ascidia are very much on the edges of the thallus. Other features include pedetia, which are characteristic of certain families of lichens, in particular the cladonia group. These can also have apothecia around the rims or on the tips of the pedetia. The final feature that I'm going to introduce you to are rhizines. These are not associated with reproduction, but provide lichens with anchorage to a surface. Rhizines are hair-like structures on the underside of the thallus and vary in form between species and so they can be useful as a taxonomic character. It is helpful to visualise the structure of the thallus when looking at different lichen species. Typically the thallus has a number of layers. There is an outer protective cortex, then a layer of photobiont. In the example you can see that the upper photo shows a layer of green alga photobiont. And in the lower example there's a layer of cyanobacteria photobiont. These are mostly restricted to the upper surface because the cells require access to light in order to photosynthesize. And so you won't see the colour of photobiont, in other words the green or blue-green pigments in the lower surfaces of the thallus if they're pressed against the substrate. The main thickness of the thallus is the medulla which is made up of hyphae the fungal hyphae also envelop the cells of the photobiont. In the lower photograph you can also see an example of a rhizine. For anybody who's interested in taking this further at a later date, it's also useful to know that the number and shape of spores in the lichen apothecia are also features helpful in the identification of different species. So looking at some of the growth forms, most lichens fall into five main types, although other forms can be recognised too. Remember that we tend to categorise things in order to help us with identification, but these categories are artificial constructs and most often in nature things don't fall into very neat categories and so there will always be examples that are in between. 
So the first type that we can look at are the crustose lichens or, or lichens which form crusts over a surface. This these types are very firmly attached to the surface and they can have very well defined or quite random edges. The thallus can be very obvious or it can be hidden in the substrate to a greater or lesser extent. So as you can see in the examples, the top left, the yellow lichen there, has a very irregular edge. And there are a few just apothecia dotted around because the bits of the thallus are actually immersed in the substrate. The example on the top right has a fairly translucent edge to it because again, part of that thallus is submersed in the substrate. Where there's, whereas there's more thallus showing towards the middle. The next type are the folios or leafy lichens. These have numerous leafy lobes that are anchored to the surface with rhizines. They are usually more loosely attached than crustose lichens. They also have multiple points of attachment to a surface. The rhizines are often underneath, but as you can see, they can be exposed when the lobes are curled and sometimes they stick out at the very tips. Next are the fruticose or bushy lichens. These differ from the folios forms in having a single point of attachment or a hold fast. The thallus then branches from that point. This form of lichen breaks the rules a little bit in regards to thallus structure because the branches are cylindrical. This means that the whole branch can be exposed to light and you can see the photobiont all the way round. If you were to cut a section through that thallus, you'd still see that the central part is lacking photobiont and will just be a mesh of fungal hyphae. Leprous lichens could perhaps be seen as a type of crustose lichen. They have a very characteristic dusty or powdery appearance. You could be forgiven for confusing them with alga. To all intents and purposes, a leprous lichen is really a form of crustose lichen. Squamulose or scaly lichens are made up of numerous leaflets and are very much a feature of the Cladonia group. You'll often see the little pedetia or those little cup-like structures that I showed you earlier arising from squamules at the base and sometimes you'll even find squamules along the pedetia. The pedetia don't always appear in some Cladonia and you may just see a mass of squamules and so it's a case of looking at them very closely to try and work out what species you're looking at. So how can we start looking at the features of different lichen species? Whilst lichens and some of their features can be really obvious, others require magnification in order to see them clearly or even to know that they're present, as well illustrated by these script lichens they just appear as thin, silvery, nondescript blotches on the trunk of this birch tree. A hand lens is an essential tool, especially in the field, and a times 10 magnification is perfectly good enough for looking at the features that I've talked about so far. Some hand lenses have LED lights built in underneath them, and that's really helpful because you have to look at these samples very close up and when you hold a hand lens over or when you're leaning over the subject you cast a shadow and so having that extra light is really helpful. And of course a lot of compact cameras and mobile phones can also take very good quality macro photos now although again you need good quality light. And if you've got access to stereoscopes and microscopes, then obviously you can look at the features in much finer detail. 
it might be necessary to take a sample. So the first thing to do is to look on fallen wood on, or bits of stone on the ground. Otherwise, it may just be a case of putting your face up to the specimen on the surface where it's growing with your hand lens. Sometimes picking samples is unavoidable, but this really does require discretion because some species are rare or they're protected. So for example, picking would be prohibited completely in a triple SI or a special area of conservation. So really it's best not to pick them unless you're familiar with which species you're looking at and whether it's a common species or whether picking it might end up destroying a rare colony. Also bear in mind that if you are going to pick a, a piece to try and help get this, the species verified, then make sure that you've got all the characteristics and features represented on that little piece of phallus that are required for species identification. And remember that you really only need a tiny piece. A really cost-effective solution for photographing detail in the field is to take photos through the hand lens with a mobile phone. Um, once you're back in the laboratory you can also do the same through uh, the eyepiece of a microscope or a stereoscope. The other thing to remember is that lichens can look very different when they're desiccated. They can look a different colour, they can look a different texture and some features won't be very visible at all. And so wetting the phallus can actually really help to see the detail. When you're out in the field, it's also worth carrying a little flask of water just to be able to do that, just to put a few drops of water on. And I'd strongly advise taking rainwater. So, I mean, I will take water from my water butt rather than using chlorinated water from the tap. You will no doubt see frequent reference to chemical spot tests to aid species ID. Transparent chemicals produce different colour reactions depending upon what pigments or chemicals are present in the lichen thallus. The chemicals are highly irritant and will also kill the lichen thallus where applied. So I won't say any more than that other than that the use of chemicals also requires care and discretion and some training. So where do lichens grow? Well, they need a surface where the thallus can gain a hold. They need nutrients, light and moisture. Some species tolerate very extreme conditions, dry or hot or freezing, and many contain pigments to protect the thallus from UV radiation. So typically those pigment, pigments are what give rise to the orange and yellow colours that we see in many of the species. Some are very tolerant and others very intolerant of pollution. So that very much depends on the species. And this is why lichens make such good indicators of air quality. As you can see in the photograph, this is a really nice example of a lichen species that's tolerant of nitrogen. It's growing only on one side of this roof, which is the leeward aspect, but there's nothing growing on the windward side. And this is because perching birds always tend to poop onto the leeward side. And it's that that's providing the nitrogen rich environment for lichen growth. So the natural surfaces where lichens grow are typically rock or wood and some species specialise in which type of substrate they grow on and others are more generalist. The pH of the substrate also influences lichen growth. A nice example of this is in the photograph at the bottom of the slide where we have a colony of Lecanora claritera growing on a church wall. The part of the colony that's growing on the acid stone is growing very vigorously, as you can see by the large, round, plump, brown apothecia. The part of the thallus that's growing on the mortar between the stones is not growing so well. 
This course was written during the coronavirus restrictions with the aim of encouraging people to spot and where possible identify lichens while out on their prescribed daily exercise. So this is the route that I took in Llanrevec and where I live and I hope that it'll give you some ideas of where to look. Each of these places represents a different microhabitat and so the species composition varies according to the environmental conditions in each place. So these are the benches in the playing field and they've seen very little use and the lichens on them are thriving. There are some really excellent examples of several species, including folio species, which as I said, they, those are more loosely attached. And so if people were sitting on these benches on a regular basis, those folio species would probably be scuffed off. The path also supports healthy colonies of lichens. A lot of these look very much like chewing gum splats. In this particular case, we've got colonies of hyper, a species of hypertrachina. But actually, when you look at paths in general, you'll probably find that what look like chewing gum splats are a number of different species. Moving on to the main path where everybody's walking their dogs, the yellow line along the base of this wall coincides perfectly with the height at which dogs can cock their legs. There are several species here dominated by yellow nitrogen loving species such as Calaplacas and Xanthorias. At the beginning of that path we have the river which also has some nitrogen loving species growing along the walls there, probably as a result of splashing from the river and then we can see we've got more lichens growing on the footpath and on the wall. There are lichens on the bench. This bench is used quite frequently and so it's mostly quite immersed crusto species thriving there. There are also, if you look at the bottom left photograph, these little spindly sycamore trees which are really inconspicuous as you walk past them but when you look close up they have a really prolific growth of very healthy lichens and quite a diversity of species. Examples of these include that middle photograph and the right hand photograph on the, on the bottom of the slide. Moving on to Glanamore Elias Local Nature Reserve. There are a few trees dotted around the edge, but one in particular, this ash tree, as shown in the bottom left photograph, has quite a number of species growing on it, possibly because it has quite an open canopy and it receives a lot of light and humidity compared to some of the other trees, which are sycamores and that have a much denser canopy. There are also a lot of species growing on the rocks around the base of the cob, which are presumably um, erosion, there for erosion defence. There are some really nice examples of Cladonias and Calaplacas and various other species. There are quite a few species growing on the walls at Llanbarvecha and railway station and different species on each wall because they're built of different types of stone. This wall caught my eye on the way home. At a glance, it doesn't look remotely interesting. It's a sort of tongue and groove concrete structure that's used to carry the A55. There's not a huge amount of growing on here, but when you look closely, you can see there's a very fine smattering of lots of tiny colonies of lichens, all of which are probably under four millimetres in diameter. And they're in distinct zones. So at the top we can see there's this sort of dark zone with some alga and staining and lichens at the top. And there's probably a lot of pollution coming over, being splashed over the top by the traffic at the top. And then at the bottom, there's this yellow line of nitrogen-loving species. Uh, and again, 
probably nitrogen rich as a result of decaying vegetation at the bottom. And then all these tiny little pepper pot sprinklings of lichen, mostly on the edges of this tongue and groove concrete. And when you look at them close up, they're really quite interesting. So now to move on to some of the species to look out for. Rhizocarpum geographicum, or the map lichen, is a very familiar crusto species found throughout Snowdonia. Very characteristic with its bright yellow green thallus and these black apothecia. You'll often see it growing on very exposed surfaces, mostly rock, and it grows much better in clean air, which is why it does so well in Snowdonia. You may see it growing in more urban environments as well, and it may not look quite so healthy, perhaps not as bright green, and it'll have fewer apothecia. A very common species is Xanthoria pariatina. This is a nitrogen tolerant species, and so you'll often find it growing around farmland. It'll grow on rock and trees, and a very characteristic feature are these numerous orange apothecia, which are sometimes quite raised up above the thallus. Another clue that this is Xanthoria pariatina is that the bits that are exposed to the sun will often be very yellow, and bits that are more hidden from the sun become very grey green. So a really good way to see this is to look at it on a twig and you'll see that if you have a single colony wrapped around the twig, the upper surface of the colony that's exposed to the sunlight will be yellow and the lower surface will be this sort of green. It's a, it's a folio species and so when you're looking at Xanthoria pariatina, look for these little leafy margins that can be lifted up slightly. It's possible to find several species of Fiskia growing on trees and wood. It's a folio species and you often find it growing with Xanthoria pariatina. In fact, this is a good opportunity to point out that you will often find communities of lichen species growing together. And in the Celtic rainforests or our Atlantic oak woods, a really good example of this would be the Liberian, but it's really, some of these communities are really specialised and so I'm not going to go into any more detail in this talk. In Fisker you'll see hair-like structures which are called cilia and they look a little bit like rhizines arising from the tips of the lobes. So one of the common species around here is Fiskia tenella. Um, I most often see this in northwest Wales, whereas in northeast Wales I tend to see more Fiskia ascendens. And the main difference is that in tenella the little cilia are quite dark and in ascendens the cilia are quite light. Fiskia ascendens also has some other features that differentiate it from Fiskia tenella, including these hood-like structures, which if you look at the ends of those very closely, you'll see a cerealia packed with ceredia. So if you remember, that's the, those, these powdery granules. And there will also be a number of these black spots or pores. The Cladonia species are very characteristic and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these or have seen them growing in various places. They really like growing amongst moss and you'll often find them in some more shaded areas. The main features are these Pedetia that look like little goblets and so you'll hear them referred to as pixie cups. And as I described earlier, 
they have a lot of these little tiny leafy or scaly squamules at the base of the pedetia. The pedetia can vary quite a lot in structure between different species. Some of them will have squamules growing along the pedetia. Some will have quite a lot of ceridia. And they can have different types of apothecia growing around the rim. And it's quite common to find them amongst mosses, but also ferns. And as you can see in the top left photograph, you'll often find these nice little ecosystems growing on fence posts. Another species of Cladonia, which you have probably seen as well, doesn't quite fit the description that I gave in the previous slide. Cladonia portentosa is quite a, a mesh-like species and it forms quite large colonies. It doesn't produce the little goblet-like pedetia. Instead, the pedetia are at the ends of these branches and you'll sometimes find the apothecia at the very tips. Another species of Cladonia that you may have seen growing amongst bilberry or heather is Cladonia portentosa. And I've put this species in because it's quite characteristic and easy to recognise, but it doesn't really fit the description of more typical Cladonias that I showed on the previous slide. It's much more mesh-like and it looks very pale and distinctive. The pedetia are the little branches at the very tip. It doesn't produce separate stalks or the little goblets like the other species. Another group of lichens which you may very well be familiar with are the peltigera or dog lichens. They have a very characteristic large leafy thallus and you'll quite often find it growing amongst moss on stone walls and in lawns and it can form very large expansive colonies. The photobiont is a blue-green alga so it's nostoc in this particular case and it gives the upper surface of the thallus a very brown appearance especially when the thallus is dry. When the thallus is wet it becomes more typically blue-green and then as I showed in some previous examples, this has these really large chunky rhizines underneath. And the apothecia grow on little stalks, which look like little rabbit ears that protrude from the edge of the thallus. Species of the Gelus graphis are characterised by these elongate, quite squiggly apothecia. The number of apothecia and the branching helps to identify the species. But you'll see I'm not actually giving you the species names for everything because in some instances you really need to have a look at other features under the microscope in order to identify them to species level. And I think when learning lichens and the same for other organisms as well, it's not always essential to identify them to species level. If you're just learning them, it's fine just to become familiar with some of the, the genera. A really good beginner species is Palmelia saxatilis because it's a very common species found growing on rock and wood and it has a lot of different features on it. So in the example here you can see that it's got brown edges to the lobes and these white reticulations. It has a lot of apothecia which are quite large and dark brown in the middle and then this foamy looking stuff which when you look at it closely you'll find are ascidia and in fact a lot of the um, enlarged photographs that I've put up throughout the talk of ascidia have actually come from this specimen. Sometimes you'll also see little tiny black things poking up through the thallus and those are the rhizines. So they're mostly underneath, but of course some of them just push up through the surface. <clears throat> A very similar species that you can also look out for is Parmelia sulcata. 
It also has these dark edges to its lobes and it'll have these white reticulations. The main difference is that Parmelia does not have acidia, but it has ceridia, so you'll be looking out for powdery granules on the surface of the thallus. Parmelia sulcata can also produce apothecia, but it, does nev it never has as many as Parmelia saxatilis. And generally speaking, apothecia are rare in Parmelia sulcata. Flavoparmelia caparata is another species that's very easy to recognise because it forms very large colonies, mostly on trees, of this very apple green lichen. It might not be so easy to spot during very dry periods because when it's desiccated it looks more grey or brown and so it's not so easy to spot. The thallus is quite lobey, very large fleshy sort of lobes and there are a lot of ceridia on the surface. I'm now going to introduce you to three species of Calaplaca. Calaplaca is quite a large genus and it's quite difficult to tell some of the species apart. It's also very similar to other genera that have yellow crustos phalli. And so as in general, these lichens are quite difficult. But the three I've got here have some distinct features that make them easier to identify. So Calaplaca flavoviricens appears like little chewing gum blots on, on the ground and it really likes to grow on concrete. It's quite brownish to see it with the naked eye, but when you look at it closely, you start to see these this quite yellow thallus with lots of little orange apothecia. And as I pointed out earlier, it's a crustose lichen and the thallus around the edge of the colony tends to be more immersed in the substrate. It can form some quite large colonies as well. Our second species of Calaplaca is Calaplaca marina, which as its name suggests grows in marine environments. And it's salt tolerant because in that environment it's exposed to heavily salt laden air. And in some cases it will be inundated periodically by seawater. It has these characteristic arcs in the thallus which are formed by the more interior parts of the thallus dying off. It could actually be confused with some species of Xanthoria, which have a similar growth habit. They become eroded in the middle too, and they can produce these arcs. And certainly in the marine environment, there are species of Calaplaca that have a similar dark orange colour. So the main thing to remember is that Calaplaca is a crustose species and Xanthoria is a folio species. And so the Calaplaca thallus will be well stuck to the surface and you won't be able to lift those edges. Whereas a Xanthoria species will have little leafy lobes which are only going to be loosely adhering to the substrate and you should be able to lift them up slightly. And the third species I'll introduce you to is Calaplaca flavicens, which looks very similar to Calaplaca marina, but the thallus tends to be a much brighter yellow, so less orange. And it also has this characteristic white line on the inside of the leading edges that are growing. Again, it can form really quite large colonies. Having said that I'm introducing you to common species, I'm cheating a little bit with this one because it's not always easy to find um, and it breaks some of the rules as well um, in terms of its growth form. It looks very much like a frutico species but it's actually a folio species and it's possible to find it growing on wood and it's very common around the better sequoid area. So it's always worth looking on the ground in the car parks 
or along the footpaths alongside the river. And the reason why I've picked it out is because it's actually quite easy to recognise. The branching phallus has these little finger-like protrusions which are quite squidgy and if you were to snip the tip off one you'll see that it has this tubular structure and this is why it breaks the rules because it's classed as a folio species because it has multiple attachment points along the substrate but the branch is a cylindrical and so you have photobiont in the thallus, thallus all the way around and then as you can see where this tip has been snipped off we have a mesh of fungal hyphae where there's no photobiont present. Usnea is a fruticose species so as I described before it has a single hold fast with fine branches radiating out from that single attachment point. The branches are very fine and quite spindly and so it has this wiry or hairy appearance. It's quite difficult to tell the species apart from each other and so at this point it's easier to refer to them just as Usnea, um, as the genus. Although I've given you one example here which is easy to recognise because it has these huge disc-like apothecia at the tips of the branches and on the edges of the apothecia are lots of little um, eyelashes or bits of phallus which give it the appearance of a Venus flytrap. So that's perhaps one that you can work out and again you'll find that on fallen branches around the better sequoid area. Avernia prunastri is a very common folio species that is well known for use in natural dyeing and the perfume industry. It's unusual in that it has the appearance of being a fruticose species when in fact it is a folio species and you can tell by looking at the thallus because it's quite flat and the photobiont is only present in the upper surface. Look for ceridia on the upper surface of the thallus and also quite loose ridges. The last group that I'm going to introduce you to are the Ramelina. Um, there are several species in Ramelina and there are three examples here that are quite easy to recognise. They're fruticose species, so again we have a thallus arising from a single holdfast and branching out. The first species is Ramelina fastigiata. This has obvious apothecia which again are disc-like structures at the tips of the branches. You could perhaps be forgiven for confusing this with Usnea florida at a first glance but the apothecia are smaller and they lack any eyelashes or little branches of thallus coming off from the edges. The second species is Ramelina farinacea. In contrast to Fastigiata, Farinacea has more features associated with vegetative reproduction. So it doesn't have the apothecia on the tips of the lobes of its branches, but it does have a lot of cerealia. Those were the little indentations or cracks that contain the powdery or granular ceridia. It also has little branching acidia off the edges of the thallus. And the third species is Ramelina silicosa and the habitat is perhaps the main thing that helps you to identify this species because it grows prolifically in marine environments. So you'll see it commonly growing on the west coast of Anglesey around Treyarba Bay and also around Harleth area. And it's a very short, stout, quite robust thallus, a little bit paler than the other two species that I've talked about already.
Fastigiata and Farinacea tend to grow more on trees, whereas Ramelina silicosa grows on rocks and some of the walls as well. I think that's plenty to be going on with and I hope you'll find much enjoyment out of being able to recognise some of the lichen species that I've talked about today. We live in a very special place and are lucky enough to have access to an incredibly diverse range of habitats and species. There's a huge amount of information about lichens available from the British Lichen Society website. There are simple keys available on iSpot, which include some of the opal guides, which are very useful and excellent for beginners. Um, the Field Studies Council pamphlets are a really handy starting point and quite convenient to carry out into the field with you as, an, as a quick reference guide. And some, of, some similar pamphlets can be downloaded from the Plant Life website. And these include some of the more specialised communities such as the Liberian. Dobson's Field Guide is definitely an essential reference for anybody wanting to take lichenology further. But it's quite an advanced text and it does involve use of keys to work out what the species are and quite often some of the chemical tests.